thank you for that introduction. Um, so uh, I saw that I am listed as the uh, first speaker, and I'm providing a case study. Um, I don't know that much about the changes, but I can give you uh, our experience on what it was like to raise money. Uh, we just closed uh, one month ago, and the process took overall about a year, although really concentrated in the past um, five months, I would say. Uh, just to give you a very brief history of Language Lab, uh, we started out five years ago, or I guess I started out, I was doing uh, doctoral research at King's College uh, in London, and I was exploring virtual worlds. At the same time, I was also studying Italian at Berlitz, and so um, I am a serial entrepreneur. I've started other companies in the past, all, all in the States. This is the first one I've done in the uh, UK. But as I was doing my doctoral research and studying Italian, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be an interesting idea if we explored how a virtual world could be used to teach languages? Uh, I hired one person, someone who's at King's College. He had just graduated, um, just got his master's degree there, and said, would you want to explore how this works? So initially, it was really more of an experiment. It, was, it actually related to my research anyway. Um, but very, very quickly, uh, the idea took off, and we were able to see how fast people could learn a language. At, at that time, actually, we were teaching Spanish and English. Um, within about a year and a half, uh, I put my PhD on hold and said, you know what, I'm just going to devote myself full time to Language Lab and see what happens. The first three years overall were all about testing, developing the product, um, really investigating where this could go. At that point, I wasn't thinking about funding. I, I have I've been fortunate some of my other uh, businesses did very well, so I had enough money to support the funding initially. Um, three years into it, we decided, okay, this is working. Let's open up. Um, let's open up for business, bring some initial clients in and see what happens. So the first big uh, step, I guess, uh, in terms of what we're talking about here is the um, moment when you say, okay, do I keep putting my own money in? Who do I go to? Where do I get funds? And this was, uh, let's see, just about 2009. And as you all know, 2009 was not the best year to go out and raise money. Um, I did talk initially to a few venture capital firms and to some larger private investors. I had a decent track record before. It was a very, very new and exciting concept. And even very early, very early on, we had good traction. Uh, but the timing just really wasn't right. So pulled back and decided, OK, let's just keep going. Let's keep things small for now and wait till it's the right time to raise money. So OK. Um, Kept going self-funding. Did talk to a couple of family members who said, oh, I like what you're doing. It's interesting. And I said, great. Do you want to put some money in? And they said, uh, OK. Um, the first three ways to raise money um, are very different from the next three ways. Uh, and each one has, um, well, I, I guess there are good sides and bad sides to each one. Self is the easiest if you have the money. Uh, it obviously involves the most risk because one person, in that case me, is putting in all the money and if things don't work out, that's gone. If you spread the risk around, uh, it's a little bit easier. Family, uh, well, as you all know, there are strings attached to family investments. Um, well, emotional strings. And if, if some people in your family are investors themselves or investment bankers, they're, um, well, I guess they're still emotional strings, but it, it becomes sometimes complicated. And then if family members don't want to invest, they're sometimes have hard feelings. Friends, again, uh, I did talk to some friends. Um, and that's where I started about a year ago, um, thinking, OK, who would like to invest in this? Uh, got some family, got some friends, and then said, OK, actually, I could probably continue this way. But let me see again what's going on in the uh, investment world. Um, so about in August, sat, I sat down and created a investor proposal. And that's when I also began networking, looking around uh, who was investing. Um, part of that was just going online and looking at VCs and angel firms and sending out emails, looking for places to pitch. The more effective way I found was to talk to people, well, actually Keystone is our lawyer, uh, talk to 
uh, lawyers that we were working with, accountants, and people that I knew to try to get personal introductions. Through that, it just happened to be that I was, Keystone said, why don't you pitch to uh, TVIN, which is the Thames Valley Investment Network, and that was sort of a dragon den um, type of pitch. I'd never done anything like that, uh, but it worked pretty well. Um, and we got a fair number of people interested. I, I put VCs, that, that order might seem strange to uh, some of you out there, um, particularly, well, maybe the VCs. Um, but I did find that in some ways, I don't know, the talk between angels and VCs for me wasn't as much who could put in more money. It was more about who's the right kind of partner. And at the stage we were in, and I, I felt ultimately that angels uh, today were a better kind of partner for where we were. Um, by the way, this entire presentation, I put it on top of what we used for our pitch that we gave at the uh, Dragon Den type of uh, uh, pitch. So um, the, the, the central part of any pitch that we always give, uh, whether it's a more formal pitch or just sitting down across coffee, um, is how does Language Lab work? So I thought I'd just spend a few minutes and walk you through. Uh, we are a virtual uh, school. People come into a city called English City to learn English. Everything starts with our website, and it's probably a little hard to see right there, but um, well, actually those are two people that, uh, well, one is a teacher, one is a student from our school, and that picture is taken within the virtual environment. But everything starts with our website. You go on and you can decide what classes you want to take. Uh, from there, students come into the world to see um, uh, actually for social reasons and for the classes themselves. Our world is about, uh, well actually now it's about 300 acres. It, it's consistently, um, it's growing all the time. Um, it's filled with everything you would want to do in a regular city. Uh, there are hotels, uh, business centers, galleries, shops, et cetera. Uh, you could see some of those in there. Um, we also have a reproduction of the Globe Theater. Uh, that picture right there is taken outside of the Globe Theater where students and teachers are actually mingling before a class. Um, that's a picture from in, inside one of our hotels. We teach uh, uh, hotel English or English for hospitality and there's a class um, where a teacher is checking in and a student is actually uh, helping the person check in. Um, here is a picture from our poetry garden. We signed a deal with the Academy of American Poets about uh, four months ago. Um, they have a garden uh, within English City where they bring in poets on a regular basis to read their poetry um, and to meet with uh, our students. And finally, that's just a picture of our welcome center. Uh, in, well, actually, it's partially in the winter. You can see it's in the fall back there. Um, to give you a sense of the changing nature of where we teach English. So, so from um, uh, your perspective, I, I think what's probably uh, on your minds is what, what really made us fundable? Um, how are we able to raise money uh, in this environment? So I, I think there are a few different areas that really helped us out. First, we're in the education space, and the education space for the past year has been a fairly hot market. Now, it depends who you talk to. Um, I would say about half the people liked education and were looking for education type companies. I did meet with some investors who said, oh, no, that's great, that's great, but can you be a game instead? So, <laughs> you know, uh, gaming obviously is very, very hot. And, and I said, no, this is what we are. And some of you might know that actually this one particular investor said, well, if you were a gaming company, I can get you the money. Um, the, uh, the, the next thing I think that made us fundable um, is that we're a scalable model. We're not 100% scalable in the way that some internet companies are, um, but our space, our city, today we can accommodate about probably almost 10,000 students, um, and we can grow it very, very fast. Uh, all of our teaching is live. We bring in real teachers from around the world. Um, which is somewhat of a challenge because we have to bring in real teachers, but we have the whole world to choose from them from. So we get today about 200 resumes a week without any advertising of people who want to teach with us. And I think that uh, investors, and you'll hear more later, um, 
they're looking for companies that have the capacity to grow in markets that are large. Um, I think key to our success is that in some ways we're a disruptive technology. We challenge the status quo of our industry. Uh, we're very different from what a traditional classroom is. Uh, we can teach, I, I think, um, actually internally we have a lot of studies that show we can teach faster and better and at a much lower price. But at the same time, we're also supportive to our industry. So we're not going out there and saying, hey, all you schools, we're going to put you out of business. We're actually working with schools. Uh, in the past month alone, we've signed up eight local London schools that have about 15,000 students to work with us to bring actually their school into our city. And so I think presenting a business that both can disrupt an industry but also work with it is a powerful way to uh, is a powerful way to build a business model. 